Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to have a, a few little clips, one of the um, Fireman's Parade and another of um, one of the individuals, a World War II veteran that we interviewed out at the, um, the airport, Keene Airport. Um, there's, I think there was five or six different um, veterans that we interviewed. What we're going to do is we're going to put one clip in each week, and then we're going to put a whole for Labor Day, not Labor Day, for Veterans Day, we'll have a whole DVD um, including all the clips. That would be the show. <clears throat> but before we get to the, um, <clears throat> the clip about the, um, the Fireman's Parade, just make a little few comments. I was on um, the radio show at, at KBK this week, and the lady called up, didn't give her name or whatever, and she said that I was kind of one of those, a rarity in um, politics that um, not only was I knowledgeable, and, um, but I was also compassionate. I don't know about as how knowledgeable. I, always, I don't think I know enough. I constantly try to, to learn more. Compassion, I think that's important in um, any, any leader. You have to have a sense of compassion um, for the people. I've learned that in the Marine Corps, and I learned that um, growing up. Some of the people that, that know my background knew I had a pretty rough childhood. Rough, but nothing I would ever switch because it made me the person I was today, am today. But the biggest thing that I, I got from the childhood was the compassion that some people showed me. Sometimes that compassion came from complete strangers. They didn't do it for me. They didn't feel sorry for me. They didn't pity me. They showed compassion, and it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of things for myself. So compassion is really important, and if anything, I'd much rather be guilty of showing too much compassion than not enough compassion. And so for the lady who said that, I thank you for that compliment. First thing I'm going to talk about today is talking about the, um, the New Hampshire Retirement Fund. We addressed a little bit on the radio show, and um, one of the things in, in the Marine Corps, all officers are, are taught, is what is the real focus? What is the most important thing? What is the thing that's going to cause the greatest damage? You can't handle everything. You can't address every single problem, but you've got to address the most serious problems. As you've known, over the, the past six, seven months in, um, up at the State House, all we've been doing is talking basically about right to work, right to work. Well, whether they pass right to work, override the um, governor's veto, or whatever, that is not going to have the big damaging effect on the way of life and the quality of life as in New Hampshire as the New Hampshire Retirement Fund. While we were worrying about right to work, we were doing an end around and the retirement fund was not addressed correctly and it has a potential of causing a hundred to hundred and fifty million dollar shortfall in 2013 that with the cities and towns will have to make up, our, our employees will have to pay more, but the big thing is we're going to have to go out a heck of a lot more services. Um, one of the benefits that I enjoy from um, traveling around the country is get out of our little cocoon and see how um, other people are addressing problems. <clears throat> this July, I went through um, Denver, and I've got the, Denver set, the Sunday Denver Post, and it says, PER paints a rosy picture. A rebound to full funding rely on investment returns that many economists doubt. Again, PERA is the Colorado um, Retirement Fund. It goes, Colorado raised its retirement age for teachers and state workers cut benefits and up taxpayers' contribution, all to avoid an evidential bailout of the $39 billion public pension system. Now the retirement fund is on target to, be, to rally within 30 years, at least on paper. A Denver Post review of the fund's financial records found that three, the three-decade recovery, based on higher investment returns than many accomplished Economists say are realistic and that the fund isn't likely to bounce back from generous benefits promised a decade ago or a crushing 2008 recession until today's retirees and many of the people managing the fund 
are dead. That's a pretty serious um, statement. But when you go in and look at um, New Hampshire, we're promising an 8.25 um, return. Again, the largest public pension fund in the country, California Public Employees Retirement System, rejected a plan to lower its rate of return from 7.75 to 7.5% in March, in part because the state could not afford steeper contributions for employees. Again, California, one of the biggest, they're saying 7.75 when they, re they know they need to go down to 7.5. New Hampshire, again, 8.25. Again, right here, the fund's investments return over the past 10 years were just 3.3%. Often cite the fund's 25-year investment returns of 9.3%. But numerous financial ec economists interviewed for the story said it's dangerous to assume investment growth to the future decades will, revival, revi will rival the prosperity of the 1980s and 1990s. More realistically, they suggest it's 6.5 to 7.5%. Colorado's 8.8% rate of return tracks with peers nationally. The average rate among public pension funds is from 7.5 to 8%. Under scrutiny by economists who argue trustees are refusing to lower the rate because it will make their funds appear even less stable. If Colorado was to use a 6.5%, for example, the state pension fund would slip to a funded status of 52%. Again, that's almost in New Hampshire range. I think New Hampshire is about the 54, 55 percent. Again, a lot of these, just because a lot of these pension funds are projecting a 7.5 to 8 percent rate of return, we know it's wrong. They know it's wrong. They're just lacking the, the political courage to do the right thing. If your own financial advisor was doing this, you'd probably sue them for, um, for fraud or malpractice. But not all pension funds are doing this. The other statewide pension fund in Colorado, the much smaller 103% funded Fire and Policemen Pension Association of Colorado, will, lower, will vote on lowering its rate to 7.5 this month on the advice of its actuary. Why is this so important? Because we're not going to raise taxes in um, New Hampshire. We're going to have to do major cuts. The so much is being downshifted to the local communities, they can't afford to come up with 100 to $150 million. So the only option that they're going to have is they're going to have to get rid of people in public safety, policemen, firemen. They're going to have to get rid of teachers. They're going to have to cut programs, cut the quality of education. They're going to have to reduce, less, reduce the amount of money they send to the university system because no one wants to stand up and do the right thing. So when I go and say, what's the biggest problem? The biggest problem right now is not right to work. The biggest problem is the bull and the elephant of the retirement fund charging through our, our China closet. If we don't address it now in two years, you'll see a marked difference in the um, state of New Hampshire. If the goal is to reduce the number of public employees, to reduce um, the size of government, this pension fund debacle will do that. So now that I said some um, dreary stuff, we'll now move on to some lighthearted stuff. We have about a 17-minute clip. It's the um, Keene's um, Fire Parade. It was held Sunday, October 9th, downtown Keene, 86-degree weather. Beautiful day for it. And again, the kids love it. There's nothing like um, a bunch of firemen to get the kids excited. So I hope you enjoy this little clip on the um, parade. It's, like I said, it's about 17, 18 minutes long. How's it going, Chief? It's going great. A little noisy today. What do we got going on today? Well, we've got the uh, annual fire prevention parade, and behind you, you hear the uh, Keene High School band. We'll be leading off the parade today for us. Um, we've got quite a few uh, pieces of equipment that's going to be coming through the parade. And it's great to see all the people out. It's a beautiful day. It's going to be a little warm, but it'll be great. Well, we're not going to complain about the warm. No, not at this time of year. But you know, warm weather like this prevents fires, right? Well, yeah, kind of. <laughs> How many different companies, um, different towns or cities did you have here? 
Uh, we'll probably have somewhere in the vicinity of 35 to 40 different communities with uh, some of the departments are bringing multiple equipment today, so we should have a very good parade for people to see. As I walked around, I, we got yellow, we got purple. What happened to all the different colors? Red flag trucks anymore? No, it's, uh, it's all preference now. It used to be red years ago, and people wanted to identify themselves, and they started switching colors out. So it's good to see the different colors. It, it's their identity. Okay, thank you. City of Kings Fire Department. Led by the Honor Guard and Kings Fire Chief Gary Lamoureux.
Well, I'm back. I hope you enjoyed the parade for the people that weren't there. You missed it. Even if you don't like parades, you don't like a lot of people, you really miss downtown Keene. It was a nice place last Sunday. The um, part of being in the Marine Corps, you learn to understand there are, there are only so many resources. You can't have everything you want. You have to decide where can you get the biggest bang for, for your buck. Excuse me. And a couple of instances that are coming up in um, Sunday's um, Keen, um, Pro, Keen Sentinel, the Monadnock Profile, considering how the military assignment system works. In this, there was two uh, major points. One was TRICARE, which is a health insurance program for um, retirees, and the other one is possible changes in the military retirement system. The, there's no doubt in my mind that I have one of the best retirement um, programs in the country. And, but there's also no doubt in my mind I'm not pay, paying my fair share for um, my um, <clears throat> health care plan. When you join the military, they said that you would be able to get health care while you're in the military. If you go in and look at the rules and regulations, health care for spouses and family members is on a space available basis. So that's why if you go to some military bases, you can get, the family members can get certain types of treatment while they can't get on another base. Other bases, there's little to no treatment for family members and they all have to go out champers or, or TRICARE. Again, that as a result of World War II, when they, when they had so many people on active duty, they just couldn't um, have enough doctors to take care of it. Plus, a lot of doctors we went to um, with the military overseas. Again, the number one priority of military doctors is keeping, taking care of the active duty individuals. People will go and say, if you have 20 years in and you retire, there's a guarantee of health care to all military retirees. <clears throat> the guaranteed is access to military health care of all retirees. But you have to be located next to a military base. It's not the government's responsibility to provide health care to someone in New Hampshire if there's no military um, facility around. And so in keeping with that, they created the, um, the TRICARE which used to be Champers and to TRICARE, where it was a health HMO type on plan that you could provide, get medical services in the local area. I use it in, in the Keene area. I use it at Cheshire Medical. I get great service from it. But the problem is, for example, I pay $460 for my TRICARE premium. First, people would go and say, well, $460, I pay about that much. No. There's a lot of people who pay about 460 on a family plan per month. I pay 460 for a family plan per year. And people go, what? So I pay basically about $38 a month for complete um, health insurance. And the government has been trying to raise those prices, but every time it comes up, it's saying you... You're going back on the promise. You're going back on the promise. Well, the price of $460 is the same price since it's been the same price since 1994. So the eight years I've been retired, I have not had a single increase in my health care. And for other people, you look at that, that's 94, that's 16, 17 years, no increase whatsoever. The problem that's happening up is now businesses are going and say, for example, if I worked for the city of Keene, the city of Keene could go and say, hey, Mr. Roberts, if you drop the Keene health care plan, we'll give you, for example, $2,500 to do that. So I go, well, I get health care services here. I'll just drop the city's plan. That may save the city twelve dollars to $13,000. I'll get $2,500 in my pocket. But now that my, all my health care now gets billed to the Department of Defense. 
In, according to this article, in 2001, the Department of Defense paid $19 billion for health care for um, active duty reser reservists, retirees, and their families. This year, it will pay $53 billion in health care. The health care was not, the TRICARE was never meant to replace civilian health care, but it has, and it's going back and forth. And so basically you're looking at almost $35 billion extra, more this year than it was in 2001. That's taxpayers' money, and that means there's savings to a lot of um, businesses. So it's kind of really an end-around way to give businesses like General Electric and other ones who have retired military, they get greater profit because they don't have to pay. So as the number goes, it says a 13% increase. Well, the 13% increase means my yearly contribution will go from $460 to $520. And I can have one visit to my cardiologist that will cost more than $520. So a great deal, but I think it's time for me and others, even if especially all retired military officers, it's time for us to pay our fair share. <clears throat> and so since we're talking about the military retirement, what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, a short clip. As many of you know, there was a B-17 and a B-24 that was in Keene a couple weeks ago. It was sponsored by Monadnock um, Aviation. The Bendells did a great job of getting it here. Basically what I read, that's only six, it's, the B-17 was one of six flying B-17s left in the world and that B-24 was the only flying B-24 left in the world. A great sight, you go in the plane, you walk through the plane, and it's really un unbelievable. You can understand for the ball tur turret on the B-17, you couldn't be bigger, taller than five foot three to go in there. You went in that ball turret, you couldn't even bring your parachute in the, if so, if something happened, you had to climb up nice and calmly, climb up, put your parachute on, go through. But when you see, when you go through the bomb bays to drop out, you'll see there's hardly no room whatsoever. If you, something gets stuck, you'd have to be able to jettison the ball, tear it, calmly grab your parachute, drop, and sub maybe from 25 to 30,000 feet, 20 to 30 degrees below zero, calmly put your parachute on before you black out, and then pull the ripcord, and hopefully you'll land without killing yourself. Much different than the, um, the movies. So here's one of the gentlemen that served in um, World War II, and I think he'll like his story, it'll be pretty interesting. Larry Saratani. Chris Roberts. Chris, it's, it's originally my, uh, from New Canaan, Connecticut, now in Marlboro, Vermont. <laughs> I'm originally from Evanston, Wyoming, and oh, now good. in Keene, New Hampshire. Yeah, well, my <laughs> wife's in Keene, New Hampshire. Well, I went in 42, I went overseas in 43, and was just charged uh, September 27th, yesterday, at the, in 45, 1945. 60, 61 years. 60, 60 some years. 66, 66 years ago. And, so, and I'll be 92 two. in December 28th. You got right here. You yeah. gave me this. Yeah. This is your plane, right? Yeah, that's it. It's either the yellow mark with the S. That was it. That was our squadron. <clears throat> the 400 and first squadron. Yeah, yeah. You can keep that because I got plenty more. You sure? You're pretty proud of this. Oh, yes. I got I about a dozen or so more. <clears throat> the 8th Air Force, that was, they took pre, a pretty hot beating during World War II. Well, I tell you, when you see those planes take off, 2,800 gallons of gas, full bomb load. And you wonder how the hell they get off the ground. We had one plane, he didn't have enough air, uh, air power. Air power. Not enough thrust to get up. It went in a little town. Good thing there was no one killed. Wiped the town right out. Old, 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 old New England, uh, England home. So I'm, I'm, I was a combat engineer, so if, look, so if I rounded off at um, 3,000 gallons and six pounds of dynamite per each gallon, that's almost, 
And yeah, not counting the bump. So counting the bump, well, that's the equivalent of about 30,000 pounds of explosives. I wonder how the hell they take off. It's just unreal. <clears throat> but they do. And, uh, and you know, of course, when they, they go on the missions, and, and of course, they carried all kinds of, of bombs, you know, cluster bombs and all that kind of stuff. But uh, we lost a lot of good men, a lot of good men, young, young fellas. Planes, when you see flares go off, you know, something's wrong. And um, we had the B-17, the guy, I can't, it begins with a K, the long one, he, he was in the B-17, he got blown out of the sky, and um, he was a POW, and he, he got rescued by the French resistance. And um, what he was talking about, <clears throat> he says in the B-17, they get hit in midair, um, flak, Oh, flak was a big, big, big problem. And it kind of tore the plane in half. Yeah, yeah. And he, he was at the door, and somehow he, he broke his arm. He couldn't move. And he, he said he was just falling. He had blacked out, and he says he felt like an angel just reached over, touched him on his shoulder, woke him up, and somehow pull able to move his arm to, to pull the cord. And, um, you know, if you haven't been, you go, oh, no, but, but when you start listening to, to more people, right? and it's kind of like there's yeah, something my, that's my unnatural. Friend, my friend was here today, Dick uh, Hamilton, and he, he, was in a, he was in the B-17s, and he got shot down, and it became a POW for almost a year, I guess. But uh, when those planes come back in, it's all shot up and all, oh, what a mess. <clears throat> and it's, and yeah, in, in the beginning, when they decided that the B-17s, the U.S. is going to do those daylight raids before you had the P-51s to go with you. With the escorts. And so you're out there. You're, you're on your own. Well, and how? <clears throat> and the, um, the unfortunate for us, the Germans produced a heck of a lot of aces using those B-17s because you were totally unprotected. Well, I got a book, sweetheart, in that folder. <laughs> Air Force News, 8th Air Force News, the mighty 8th. The man who saved the 401st Bomber Group. He died about uh, two years ago. James Howard, Howard. And um, <clears throat> the, the other thing, when as you go back, we may go look at a squadron commander today. A squadron commander today may have 12 airplanes and the guy oh, may yeah. be 38 or 40 years old. When you go back and oh, some of these guys, you have 18 to 24 planes in a squadron, the guy may be 26, 27 oh. years old and being a squadron commander. And some of these, a lot of them, you guys were kids, 17, 18 years old flying. Unreal, unreal. And you go, we look here in, in Keene, we're complaining about We've got 17 or 18 year old kids running a skateboard downtown or riding a right. bike where in 17 years old, 18 years old, you're left on a B-17 fully loaded daylight raid. And once that door closed, you had no, no idea. idea. No. You had no idea what you were, you were going to happen. If worst case, you get killed. Or maybe even worse, you survived but spent two, three years in a POW camp. Oh, yeah, there you go. And, um, so that, that is something, huh? <clears throat> Isn't that a nice picture? Look. That is. See, that, that was, that was our, our... That's your ass, yeah. yeah. That's it right there, see? And even when you look at this picture, this picture makes the plane look so much bigger than it actually is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the guy, he, James Howard. He's the one that he shot down. I have the whole history there, how he shot down. Man who say the four for How many planes? Isn't that nice? Isn't that wonderful? The, um, when the, the P-51s came. <clears throat> yeah, we had them on our base for a bit, too. It, they, changed, they, it changed the whole, the whole set. They, they, would, they would come in and land in our, 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 our field. And I don't know why, but they would do it just for a short time, and off they go. You know how those fighter pilots are. You know, they yeah. get cocky. Oh, they think, they, they think yeah. they're the best. They're the one right. who chases while you guys are just the right. mule drivers, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> the, um, <clears throat> we were t I was talking to the other individual 
I remember watching some of the movies where, you know how those supply offices sometimes, oh, yeah. they're a pain in the butt, the quartermasters, they don't go to the front line, they just worry about dollars and figures. And they, the, the guy, the general, was, was getting really ticked because the P-51s were dropping their fuel tanks to go with you. And he's saying, don't you understand how much these tanks cost? And it's, you just go halfway and then come back. And of course, you guys say, no, no. go all <laughs> the way. You don't care what a tank costs. Gosh, say, this has been wonderful, you know, talking it, with you here. I, I appreciate this. You know? And um, this, this is really, really important because we're all getting older. We don't teach this stuff in the books. Talking to you and talking to other, other gentlemen, it's important. You guys are reality. You guys are the connection to, to, the, to the future. Well, and so my grandsons will watch this isn't that in, the, wonderful? in the DVD. The people in Keene will watch it. Right. And a copy of it will go to Historic Society. So God people, bless. So if people want to go in, so 10, oh, 15 years ago. I'm honored. <clears throat> no, I'm honored. I'm uh, honored that you, you said know? yes. Well, back again. Hopefully you found that um, gentleman's story quite interesting. And I did. I was really awestruck by some of the information that I, I've learned from these individuals. It's nothing like the storybooks, nothing like the, the war movies. It's not like Rock Hudson or John Wayne or Cary Grant. These are real individuals who went in as young men, giving did a job, went through hell, came back, raised a family, and became highly productive um, Americans. You look at some of them, 85, 86 years old, much better shape than some of 50 and 60 year olds. So while we're talking about some of these um, gentlemen in their, in their 70s and their 80s, well, I think the youngest World War II veteran right now is 82 years old. I'm going to talk about a few things that are affecting a lot of people, elderly people. And um, I know elderly, that's not really a great word because there's people 90 years old, Granny D was 100 years old, had more spry and more gumption than I've seen in some 20 and 30 year olds. But um, again, an article in the Keene Sentinel Sunday Low interest CDs are eaten into retirees' nest egg. Where it went, the average one year CD now yields just 0.4% return. On a $100,000 CD, you get $400 for the year. Three years ago, you would get $2,400. Four years ago, you got $3,750. What's the difference? $3,750, for example, if you lived in a $150,000 house, just the return at 3.75% return, that would cover your property taxes for the year. Well, now all you get $400. That's not going to cover anything. So now that has definitely has an effect on your quality of life. Plus, the Federal Reserve has decided to help out banks and other ones and help out the government because it's in debt, is going to ensure that short-term treasury bonds <clears throat> and buying long-term bonds are going to stay at low interest rates. Low interest rates may be great for um, people that um, want to buy a house. My daughter is down in Georgia. She's selling her house and wants to buy a new one. She called me up and says, hey, Dad, I can get a mortgage for 3.94%. Those are kind of like 1940, 1950 mortgage rates. It's great for her, but how, do, how good is it for someone 65, 70 living on a fixed income and trying to get return on their investments? <laughs> Give an example. Comcan report, retiree Ed Schwartz of Western Florida said he and his, he and his wife recently saw $10,000 evaporate just in a single week from stock um, portfolio. For the average couple that's living on Social Security, that's almost a year's worth of income. Bingo, gone within a week. He said the couple sold some of their stock and decided to cut back on expenses and curtailing vacation plans. 
Schwartz added that he and his wife worked hard all their lives and faithfully stay, saved to be able to have a secure retirement, but now he's in doubt. But now that's in doubt. He's 73 years old. I think his wife's 71. If they run out of money, what are they going to do? Are they going to go back to work? If they go back to work, how do they get to, how do they get to work? Where do they get to work? Um, some of these people, highly educated, have done a lot. I don't think they want to end up at, at a greeter at Walmart or a stalker at Target. It's thankful that Target and Walmart are giving a lot of retirees the opportunity to earn money by working part-time. But like he said, they're giving up vacation times to work just to be able to survive. Again, the quality of life all depends on you being able to get out there, be active, enjoy life, not the, sitting there saying, I don't have money for food, I don't have money for utilities, I don't know how to pay my mortgage. Um, some people do have mortgages now. A couple of these individuals had mortgages. And it's just not the um, way it's supposed to go. And then on the other side, you've got different organizations, and, and I won't name them, who are out there and saying, hey, we're going to... We're doing this. We've got these special programs for the elderly, or we've got these special programs for, for veterans. Well, I sat down and looked at one, and it says, okay, $50,000 in life insurance. Almost everybody, no, no medical exam, only asks, answer three simple questions. And so I looked at it. And so if I was 60, I would pay $108 a month for five months. Once I turned 65, $143.96 <clears throat> for another, five, another 60 months. 70 to 74, $207.25 a month for 60 months. But if you read the fine print, the insurance ends at 80. And when the, the price for 75 to 80, 79, they didn't bother putting that number in. So when I, I ran the numbers, that means if you bought this life, this life insurance program at age 60 you would, and you stayed, kept it for 20 years, you would have paid in excess of $42,000. And if you, lived, if, you made, if you made your 80th birthday, the life insurance ends. And you would have spent $42,000. And basically looking at this, you get nothing back. <clears throat> Again, so... His part of things, people are kind of getting desperate. You're told that you don't want to um, leave um, bills to, to your um, survivors. This is really your responsibility to, you know, be a good um, adult, take out life insurance, protect the people you, you leave behind. But again, <clears throat> like a lot of these programs, you really have to um, sit down and look at them. I recommend going places like the Keene Senior Center and some of the other organizations. If it seems confusing, talk to the people down there, ask them, and ask them for clarification because it may not seem like much. But if you're 60 years old, there's a good possibility you're going to live past 80. If you're in halfway decent health, there's a good possibility. And to spend $42,000 and end up with nothing, $42,000 is an awful lot pretty expensive for a peace of mind for a few years. Now, coming back to, um, we had talked about the um, TRICARE. Now again, this is going to talk about the military retirement system. For the people who've been in the military, you do your 20 years, and once you're 20 years, you get at 50% of your time. In. Um, Every year that you stand, go past um, 20 years, you get another 2.5%. Two and, um, and it's calculated on every full month. Like, for example, mine, I think I get 52.5277 of my final active duty pay. And then, excuse me, I get a cost of living increase every year, the same increase as Social Security. And again, no doubt, no question, military officers, the more senior you are, the um, greater the retirement check that you're going to get. A lot of retirees, um, military, retire at um, 05 or lieutenant colonel or commander, 
and they get a pretty good time. A lot of troops retire at E7, and they don't get maybe seven, eight hundred dollars a month. But now we're looking at um, a possible portable retirement, so people go ten years and get a retirement fund. Now, well, I think the Marine Corps at seventeen percent of the people collect retirement. Here it says seven percent of the people collect retirement. So many people will spend 10, 13, 12 years in the military and end up with nothing. I think we need to look at the retirement system because we have far too many veterans who have spent six, seven years homeless. Iraq veterans, we have women, a lot of women from Iraq and Afghanistan are homeless, unemployed. We need to do something for the people who give us 10 years of their lives. So time has flown by really quick. And so... We're going to try to stay out on the road a little bit longer, find more stuff, get more articles, and so I'll see you on the long road, and thank you.